What could have given him that idea? What was in store for me now? Had God performed some kind of miracle for me? Dozens of thoughts and questions floated through my mind as death hung over me. I couldn't comprehend anything, and so I didn't feel any fear or anger at my impending death. I was simply curious what had happened to me. Before I had a chance to find that answer, the Lord swung down his Oh my god, that was a novel. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, uh, yes, just to, uh, properly say hi to the folks in chat. Sorry that we weren't super responsive during that time, but it didn't seem like a good spot to interrupt to say hi to folks. Thank you for coming! Without warning, without any time to prepare, the darkness drains away. And a second later, I crash into the stairs, hard. Right out to my ear, I can hear the hiss of the river of blood. The world fades in and out of view, giving way to a very real images of a past I never lived. I can practically feel the fire in the eyes of that mad blood banquet guests. My vision distorts. I can't regain my focus. Whose blood is this streaming down the stairs? Is it hers? Is it mine? Who am I? A saint? A witch? Is what I'm seeing through a lens of clarity or madness? Wait, no, no. I am not her. I am Michelle, no one else. It hurts, doesn't it? It's hard to breathe. Your chest is on fire. Your vision is blurry. It's dark. It's lonely. It's scary. It's frustrating. It's disheartening. It's exasperating. Isn't it? What you're feeling is exactly the pain I felt. <sighs> I reach my hand out in a plea for help. Which is when I see something I can hardly believe. Whoa. Okay. Both of my arms are covered in gashes, blood flowing from them without end. The raw flesh beneath my skin has been exposed to the open air. Ah! All I can bring myself to do is scream. That's pain. Her horrible past is doing everything in its power to break me. That nine-year-old girl's sickening experiences are twisting and constricting and crushing me. Why is this... Happening to you? Are you really that slow, my dear? You are empathizing with my pain. You are just that kind-hearted, Michelle. <laughs> you said you wouldn't give up, didn't you? That you would make your way to me. Then surely this won't be enough to do you in. Uh, of course it won't. Mustering up every last bit of strength I can, I begin crawling up the stairs. The red river peats against my open wounds, stinging painfully. The simple act of lifting an arm or a leg is almost unbearably agonizing. The blood dripping from my lacerated arms mixes with the blood already soaking the tower. So this is... The pain Morgana suffered. Do you despise everyone, Morgana? Did your resentment at your mother's betrayal 
at the people who came seeking your blood, at the Lord who took your life, turn into a hatred for all mankind. Your perception of me is still incorrect, Michelle. My grudge is only against a select few. Think about it, my dear. Of the thousands, millions, billions of people living on this planet, my world is comprised of but a minuscule fraction of that. Hatred for all mankind? No, what I feel is not nearly so nebulous. Although, if I had died still believing I was a saint, maybe I wouldn't have such a well-defined mission. Are you saying the Lord didn't kill you? Oh my, did you actually think that was the end of my Oh no, we have a whole other book coming out. Discord just raced through that entire sentence you said. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's been doing that a lot. Like, well, not a lot, a lot, but... No. <laughs> Despite all your big talk, you're afraid of having to suffer through any more of that, aren't you? But you're the one who said you wouldn't give in. So go on. Know my pain. Without losing your mind. Uh... <sighs> Once again, my surroundings crumble. I have no say. I have no chance to object. Before I'm dragged back. To that repulsive banquet. I reach out, stretching my hand as far as it will reach, but all I can grab is darkness. My bloody body sinks back into the abyss. The pain becomes more than just a memory, eroding away at my consciousness. You're a damned witch wearing a saint skin! Sorry, I'm just drinking something real quick. <laughs> Maybe if I had died then, I wouldn't have become the witch you know now. But that's all conjecture. Theorizing what, about what could have happened is an exercise in futility. But no, I did not die that day. Brought together by constant mistreatment, the Lord Slaves chose that moment to start the revolt. When he swung down his blade, someone bumped into him and it was knocked off its corner. I didn't have the strength to get to my feet, so I simply watched the chaos unfold before my hazy eye. It never even occurred to me that I should try to escape. At some point during the riot, a young man, one of the slaves, grabbed me by my bloody limp arm and led me out of the Lord's The young men brought me to a slum, a place where the people banded together in their hardship, barely scraping together enough to eat every day, let alone pay the taxes demanded of them. By the time we had arrived at a small brothel located a ways into the slum, the fog was starting to clear from my mind. I knew where we were, and feeling the gaze of those scantily clothed women, I trembled. In a sense, that was possibly the most frightened I had ever been in my life, despite everything else I had been through. The idea that I had fallen so far, and that I would be have to become a prostitute scared me to death. After all, I was a saint, and saints were supposed to be spreading my legs for any men who gave me enough coins would shatter my very identity. As all that was going through my mind, I probably shouted no in protest, because a slave gave me an exasperated look and told me he hadn't brought me here to become a prostitute. He said he knew someone here, someone I could trust, and that she would give me a room. I had trouble believing him, though. I couldn't trust the word of a prostitute. Someone who valued money more than her own body. It was all a trap, I was sure. One day they would tell me I had to work. Nothing he said would convince me otherwise. Apparently sensing my mistrust, the slave gave me an apologetic frown and handed me a mirror, saying, Even if I did, you couldn't get any work looking like that. I could not believe what I saw. That couldn't be my face. It had to be an illusion. There was no way. That was not the face of a saint. It couldn't be. 
It wasn't real. It wasn't possible. Patches of skin had fallen off my face, exposing the raw red flesh beneath. It looked quite similar to what had been done to my arms and legs. Except my face had a... Looking at myself in the mirror, even I doubted my own sane. The thing in my reflection was a hellish abomination. It was the twisted face of a woman. And although I was shocked by what I saw, at the same time it answered several lingering questions. It explained why the Lord and his guests had panicked at the sight of me. And it also explained why he said I was a witch wearing a saint's Over the course of the dozens of banquets I had participated in, my face must have mutated, twisted into this ugly, sickening, monstrous thing. The sight of what had become sapped the last bit of willpower from me. Not because I was particularly fond of my face or thought myself especially beautiful, but because it cried to see everything saintly about me crumble up. Test from God or otherwise, I didn't have the strength left to attempt to overcome it. Deciding I would rather be dead than struggle any longer, I begged the slave to kill me. Taking one's own life was a sin. If I did that, I would not be able to return to my father's side, and I wanted to ask him why I had been put through such tribulation. But the young man refused. He said, completely missing my intention, that if I persevered, good fortune would eventually find me. He said that if I lived on, I would eventually have a chance to get my pay. I had no such otherworldly concerns, though. But if no one would take my life, I had no choice but to live. I despised life at the brothel. The men who came to buy their services were disgusting buffoons. The kind of people who would think they could deceive God. And the women fawning over them were just as repulsive. That said, I had nowhere else to go, which meant I was forced to suffer that sickening place. But by the time a year or so had passed, my feelings about it had changed. The women of the brothel took good care of me, treating me like a sister. At first, it was just irritating. I was a saint, and how could a saint have prostitutes for sisters? But over time, I got to know them better, grew to appreciate their circumstances and hardships. Despite barely having enough money to keep food on the table, whenever they had a little spit to spare, they would use it to purchase medicine. Ointments to apply to my arms, legs, and face. And as a result of their generosity, my legs... My arms and legs started looking almost human, but nothing had any effect on my face. Occasionally, the slave would drop in to check on me. The other men thought me ghastly and wouldn't get anywhere near me, but he was different. And every time he visited, he would say, One day, I'll show you the world. And to tell you the truth, I was beginning to, I was beginning to grow attached to it. My time at the brothel was probably, all things considered, one of the brighter chapters of my life. There, I was neither a saint nor a witch, but another human girl. For the first time, I felt like my life had meaning beyond my assumed divine purpose. I was even beginning to feel kind of happy. And with each passing day, my intra intractable worldview was gaining a little flexibility. Perhaps I could perform miracles, but that didn't necessarily mean I had to be the daughter of God or a saint. Maybe I was just a regular person who happened to possess some unusual abilities. Ridiculous, isn't it? Despite coming to accept my humanity, I refused to let go of his powers. They were the last thing protecting what I thought of as myself. But to me at the time, it felt like a very dramatic change of heart. Three years after the revol revolt at the Lord's Manor, I had my 12th birthday for which they threw me a little dinner party. The women all pitched in to bake me treats and the young slave man was there too. I was happy. I thought that if life could continue on like this, I was fine with not going back to being a saint. But for some reason, for some reason, happiness always seems to slip away as soon as you've got your hands on it. Just like Giselle. <laughs> no one sincerely wants to lose it, so why must they? I certainly didn't mind not being miserable. Let me tell you what happened that night. On the night of my birthday celebration, bandits attacked the brothel. Now, bandits are hardly a rarity in that time, so everyone was always on the lookout and we never went out at night. They wouldn't stop at robbing you either. They were armed with blades and would frequently kill their targets if necessary- Oh, shoot. But cautious as we were, we were helpless against the direct raid. The brothel fell into a panic, screams echoing into the night. The customers were carved up and left for dead, the women were bound and stowed away to be sold. My peaceful words shattered in an instant. And the next thing I knew, I was some slave trader's merchandise. 
I don't know what became of the prostitutes who cared for me, or the slave who brought me to them. I assume the women were sold and the young man slaughtered. But regardless, I find myself being rocked around in the back of a carriage once more. The carriage was packed so tight you could barely see the floor and it smelled like death. Sweat, urine, feces, every foul odor imaginable compressed into a tiny space. There were both men and women there, nearly all of them muttering or groaning or weeping. Everyone was young, ripe to be put to work. It didn't take me long to realize what fate awaited these people and me. And when I did, I just sat there in silence. Then for the first time, I cried. I was experiencing, I believe, a very human emotion. I was sad, hurt that I had been taken away from a place where I was happy. From the woman at the brothel and that young man, it crushed me. And no longer did I wonder why such a thing was happening to the Holy Daughter of God. Something about my tears must have seemed strange to him because one, one, saw, one man saw me and said, Why are you crying? He was a curious man. To start, he looked very different from anyone else. The color of his skin, the length of his nose, the shape of his eyes. Everything about him was new and unusual. Hesitantly, I replied, I'm sad because I didn't get the chance to show my gratitude to people very deep. The man fell silent, looking as though he was deep in thought. I had no idea why he had asked me that, but something about him made me and didn't bring myself to ask. Several hours later, the man suddenly stood up. The guards had no patience for anyone stepping out of line, and they didn't look like they would hesitate to kill us. So, unsurprisingly, one at the back of the carriage drew his sword and pointed it at the man. What was surprising, though, what was that happened next? The man, his hands shackled like the rest of him, putting his fist into his face and stealing his sword. The entire carriage was in shock. The guards were too stunned to effectively react, so they were quickly cut down. And because the one-man uprising had taken place between cities, there was no one the slave traders could ask for help before they were slaughtered. In the blink of an eye, it was all over, and there was nothing human about what I had witnessed. If I had to describe it, I would say it was as though a wild beast had attacked. The man ruffled through the stairs' clothes until he found the keys, which he brought to me, ordering I unshackle him. And so I did, as he commanded. Once they had had enough time to process what had happened, the would-be was applauded. The wretched souls had been saved, and for a moment I believed so too. When the man's hands were free, he rolled his shoulders a couple times, made sure everything was in place, and then he began his mass- What the hell?! <laughs> Pretty sure this is Yuki Mata. <laughs> oh! Screams of agony filled the carriage as he ran his sword to the helpless men and women packed inside it. Blood and guts were splattered against every surface. And those who tried to escape did not get far before being mercilessly skewered. It was like a scene out of a nightmare. I was frozen in place. Not out of fear, but because my mind had shut down. I couldn't make sense of what was happening, so my mind rejected it. And with my brain having given up, my body was no more than a lifeless puppet. Oh, I thought we were done! You want me to take over? Well, actually, let's- uh, I'll take drag. O I'll take over this, and then, uh, once it's finished, it'll be the end of the stream. In short order, all the slaves were dead, and I was sitting in a pool of blood, staring at the man. He pointed his blade at me, and with a little smirk said, Why didn't you run? In turn, I asked him, Why did you kill them? The smile vanished from his face, and after a few quiet moments of pondering, he replied, Because I felt like it. And why haven't you killed me yet? I asked. To which he gave a curt, I don't know, then withdrew his blade and wandered off into the distance. And then I was all alone, surrounded by corpses. I glanced down, and half of someone's face was looking back up at me. Oh. I don't like that. <laughs> Which part? <laughs> How it's just literally a bunch of... Like, reading a book in the middle of a game. That's so... Uh, I mean, it's a... Like, it's a her story's interesting. 
But yeah, I don't know. I didn't like it. I, I liked think, her story, just not the way it was presented. I think the prequel uh, presents her story, you know, in the way the rest of the game has. But don't quote me on that, since I haven't looked into the prequel at all. I hope so. If it if they if it does, and that's that's better. It kind of makes up for it. But like, I was, at some point, I was like, okay, okay, God, okay. <laughs> All right, well then, we have reached 10.30, so it is the end of the stream. Thank you all for coming, especially to all the new faces. We always stream the house in Feta Morgana on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9 p.m. EST. Oh boy. <laughs> we are really getting into the thick of it all. I'm so glad that we're finally getting this backstory, e even if it's presented in a, in a different way. I, as I mentioned, I think that that uh, person who killed everyone was Yukimasa, so it's making me think that maybe the slave boy that uh, brought her to the brothel might be Mel. But Ooh. it's really making me wonder, well, if that's all Mel did, then why was he dragged into this curse as well? Right, since apparently she liked him enough and was happy being around him and all the other people. Yeah, so I'm going to assume that he either reappears, or that there's still aspects that were missing, or maybe she is just really petty that he let her experience a moment of happiness that was then <laughs> that then made everything else so much worse. So she was like, "No, you're gonna be stuck." Yeah. Hmm. Yes, we will have to do that, and we will open up with whatever ideas we have. But as always, this stream is for Extra Life. We are very close to our goal. We are right now at 245 of 300. You can check out our donation link right below the vid. So if you have a dollar sp uh, spare, that all goes to the Dayton Children's Hospital in Ohio. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> it needs more cake. <laughs> Give her I'm sorry for your face cake. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm so oh god, I'm gonna be smited right, right where I'm sitting. <laughs> Toodaloo, everyone. I'm at a loss about her. Son. To learn she lives, then lose that hope seems cool. She wouldn't want us to waste time talking. She'd want us to find Durva. She said he raved about smoke darkening the sun. Tell him what you found in his papers. A letter. It mentioned a shipment of Blaze being sent to a warehouse here. Only, it wasn't addressed to Duval. The name is Aeland Forgeman. Does that mean anything to you? Uh, sounds familiar. Yes, a landlord. The Osaram have been buying up buildings across the city, including one under that name. Let me think. It's by the edge of the Mesa, near the temple. It used to be a shop, but it could serve as a warehouse. If Durval used the name as an alias to buy it, he might even be there now. I'll round up my men. I'll meet you there. Erend, wait. Remember that no one hates Durval more than your own tribe. The clans would give up much to obtain him. Take him alive? So you can haggle over him? You can't be serious! Our security depends on keeping the peace. If the opportunity presents itself, take him alive. 